Good morning, everyone. We're glad to be here with you this morning. Don and I are quarantining, and we're celebrating this 4th of July weekend and hoping for the best health for everyone. Let us pray. Dear God, I pray that my voice will sound a liberty bell throughout this nation for freedom, justice, and equality for all people. In the name of our beloved Christ and Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom. Today I'm going to take my cues from Pastor Veronica, who has boldly been telling us that we need to correct the text and deconstruct systemic interpretations and theologies that harm people and that do not represent the character of our loving creator God. So just to get warmed up, let's start with the Declaration of Independence, a core document for our 4th of July celebration, which says that all men are created equal. One word in this text makes all the difference in this magnificent document. And that one word, all men are created equal, what a huge amount of harm the choice of that one word has done. So I'm going to continue this theme by correcting one of the most ancient and foundational biblical texts that has had a profound impact on all of the religions based on the Bible, including Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. This is the story of Sarah and Abraham. The religions that spring from them now encompass about 55% of the world's population. The part of the story I'm telling today is about gender and how God can how God can empower us through our various genders in blessing the world. So let's get started. Fasten your seatbelts and let's time travel back to about 4000 years ago back to Christ 2,000 years, and then 2,000 years farther back in ancient history, when Sarai and Avram, later to be Sarah and Abraham, lived in the city of Ur, one of the greatest and most ancient cities in Mesopotamia. So let's start with Sarai, because she doesn't get a whole lot of attention, and we need to know more. Fortunately, we can no more because archaeology has uncovered a lot of relevant information. So here's some of what I found. Names in the Bible are very important. And the root of Sarai's name is Sar, S-A-R. Sar was a title of royalty for the Akkadian kings who conquered all of Sumeria beginning around 2300 BC. The first and greatest of those kings was named Sargon, who established the world's first empire, covering most of the area of the ancient Near East. And then he took his armies all the way west to the Mediterranean Sea. Huge territory, Sargon. You see that Sar in his name. Kings who came after him in his dynasty also had the title of Sar. The Sar names are unique to that dynasty. The Sar title was used only for royals, and it was not to be used by others on pain of death for treason. The title Sar included both males and females. So 
how did Sarai in our story get the Sar in her name? She must have been royalty. Her name means princess. I'm going to present a possible plausible story about Sarai based on archaeological evidence and the Bible text. Sargon, the great conqueror, had a daughter named Enheduanna. She is a historical figure well attested. When Sargon conquered the area around Ur of the Chaldees, he himself married his own daughter, Enheduanna, and sent her to Ur as his queen to be his Sar and his top administrator to organize and to secure that part of the kingdom. Very powerful woman. Now, in addition to being his daughter and queen, he appointed her as the high priestess of the temple of the goddess Ishtar in Ur. Ur's temple was an architectural wonder, a massive ziggurat rivaling the pyramids of Egypt at that time in size and splendor to some extent. The temple was also a cultural center with libraries, education, record keeping, the arts, literature, and much more for that entire era. In Hejuan was the chief ruler and chief priestess over all of this. Indications are that Sarai was, or certainly could have been, the great-great-granddaughter of Sargon and Queen Enheduanna, royalty. And since Enheduanna's position was passed down to the next generations, it could potentially be that Sarai was in line for that position. We must carefully note that Sarai had a genetic history of incest between great-great-grandfather and grandmother, which can often produce harmful genetic weakness and diseases in the ancestral line. And the first thing we find out about Sarai is that she is barren and cannot conceive a child. Now let's talk about Sarai's genealogy on her father's. Her father's name is Tarach, and he would have had to marry royalty for her to have the Sar title. That could not have happened unless her father, Tarach, was a very high official in the service of the Sargon dynasty and had the power and position to marry into a royal family. Now we know about Tarak because his name is in the Bible in some of those very boring genealogies. Tarak stands out from 10 generations of his male predecessors because uh, he is not as fertile as they were. They would have sons around the age of 31, 32, 33 years of age. And after that, they all lived for a few hundred years and had more sons and daughters. So happens the Bible keeps track of these things. Instead of age 31, 32, 33, Tarek didn't have his first child until age 70. It took him twice as long as his ancestors. And after age 70, it does not say he had sons and daughters. He has just four children and then no more. That is the subtle way the Bible says Tarek had a fertility problem. He wasn't normal for his family history or his day and age. In the science of our day, he may have had any of several 
fertility conditions we see ads for on TV. Now, when Tarek finally had children, one of them was his daughter, Sarai, and he also had three sons. One of them, wait for it, was Avram, who will eventually become Abraham. So let's get this straight. Terah has his son Avram by one mother and his daughter Sarai by another mother. Yes, Sarai and Avram are brother and sister from different mothers. Now, we thought it was shocking for Sargon to marry his daughter, but it is just as shocking to our modern ears that Avram and Sarai, brother and sister, are also joined in marriage. She might have been around 15 and he might have been maybe 25. So think about, once again, those genetic aberrations and incest. The text says right up front that Sarai is barren because she cannot conceive. You don't have to be very perceptive to read the story and see that Avram is also most likely impotent because he doesn't have any children for even far longer than his father, Tarek. And Avram doesn't marry another woman either, which would have been a good option if he were fertile. But he doesn't marry another one. It is possible that Avram's father's infertility genes are passed down to both Sarai and Avram, who then have their own incestuous relationship that would aggravate the whole gender and fertility problem for the future of humankind. If this story doesn't sound familiar, it probably isn't because it's not usually told, even though it's right there in the Bible, right in front of our eyes. Now, sometime around 2100 BC, Sargon's empire falls apart, and the great city of Ur, where Terah, Avram, and Sarai live, falls into chaos and destruction. The whole family decides it's time to escape from Ur and head west. They leave when Avram is 75 and Sarai is 65, headed for a place we know will eventually be the promised land. They're both already getting old. No children. Now I'm going to move this along fast. And I'm going to leave out a lot of their story to get to the point of our story today. The fact that Avram and Sarai are genderly dysfunctional presents several problems. For one thing, Avram's name means father of many nations. And he has no children. Now that is downright embarrassing. No wonder patriarchal theologians have tiptoed around that. It's also dangerous because as they set out on a long nomadic trip as refugees, Avram has no sons and daughters to manage his affairs, keep the herds and flocks, form marriage alliances, provide security, and acquire wealth on the trip. He is vulnerable. And to complicate matters, God, Yahweh, keeps showing up and telling Avram that 
He's going to be the father of many nations with seed like the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. Now, over the next 25 years, God will talk to Avram seven times saying the same thing. Unfortunately, all the way up to almost his 90s, no evidence, no babies. The story is telling us that Avram cannot fulfill his destiny to be a dad. And Sarai cannot fulfill her destiny to reign as a queen. So Avram is worried, mostly about himself, since God is talking to him, possibly not to Sarah. We don't know. When they start out on the trip, he says to Sarai, you are so beautiful and queenly looking that if some powerful chieftain or king comes along and thinks you're my wife, he'll kill me and carry you off. So let's not tell anyone we are man and wife. Instead, let's say we're brother and sister. In other words, Sarai, sacrifice yourself to another man so I can live. It seems to me that somewhere in there, it's similar to human trafficking and slave trade. So we're just hitting the highlights here. Avram and Sarai travel down to Canaan, and then they go on down to Egypt because there's a severe famine in the land of Canaan. They get close to Egypt, and Avram says to Sarai once again, you are so beautiful, and your name, Sarai, marks you out as royalty. The Egyptians will see you and want you as their wife, and they'll kill me and take you. So say you're my sister. Sacrifice yourself so I can live. This is two times, he says. This. So Pharaoh's sons actually do see here, and they go tell their dad. They say, there is this beautiful Akkadian princess named Sarai out here with her brother. Pharaoh calls them in and sees how gorgeous she is. And very likely he thinks he's making a royal alliance with a Mesopotamian king. And he takes her into his palace as his wife. And he pays Avram a huge bride price for her. Flocks and herds and donkeys and camels, male and female servants, and enormous wealth of gold and silver. Avram cashes in. It's in the book. Then God shows up to defend Sarai. God strikes Egypt and Pharaoh's house with plagues. Pharaoh figures out what the problem is. It's Sarai. And he gets really mad. And he says to Avram, why didn't you tell me she was your wife and not your sister? I would have let you go. Now you've brought this plague on Egypt and on my house. Leave Egypt now with your wife. Take the whole bride price. Just leave. Take it all so the plagues will be lifted. And Avram gets out of town, loaded with wealth that came from God's love and protection of Sarah. Does this story sound familiar? It, if, if it doesn't, it could, because it happens again a few hundred years later when Moses is in Pharaoh's house and causes plagues that result in the exodus of the Hebrews from Egypt. Moses was not the first Hebrew who caused an exodus from Egypt. He was following the playbook 
of his ancestor, Sarai. That whole experience may have been uncomfortable for Sarai, but it worked really well for Avram, who goes back to Canaan, a wealthy and powerful man. And God keeps talking to him and telling him he's going to be a father of many nations. Avram thinks God's promises are all about him and not about Sarah. Therefore, he can use her as a bargaining tool because after all, he knows she's been barren since she was born. He saw her in the cradle. So Avram pulls the same trick again that he used with Pharaoh. It's in the book. The Canaanite Abimelech, King Abimelech, sees Sarai, how beautiful she is, and wants to marry her. They tell him they are brother and sister, and Abimelech takes her as his wife and pays a huge bride price. And then God sends a plague of infertility that strikes all the women in Abimelech's, kill, uh, Abimelech's kingdom. Same story all over. Abimelech says, take the woman back. I didn't touch her. Keep all the bride price. Pre please pray to God to forgive me and heal my women. Go on your way. And Avram is even richer from his abuse of his wife. So what happens in this story? Basically, Avram gives up on Sarai. Sarai gives up on herself. Avram has twice bargained her way to save his own skin and acquire immense personal wealth. They have both together connived and schemed and manipulated and deceived to try to bring about the miracle of fertility and the promise of nations and kings. And neither Sarai nor Avram gets it. They do not get that God wants the genders to be equal. And then more time passes, and Avram is 99 years old, and Sarai is 89. We're right at the end. The bodies of both Sarai and Avram are as good as dead, so says the scripture. When Avram is 99, Yahweh shows up again. And this time, Yahweh really shows up. Yahweh appears to Avram. So Avram can see Yahweh. And what does he see? Yahweh says, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and behold. Be complete. And here's where we correct the text, as we did in our first hymn this morning. The English translation usually has Yahweh saying, I am God Almighty, as in holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. That translation comes from the King James, and we've been stuck with it. Because when those male translators saw what El Shaddai really means, I'm sure they couldn't believe their eyes. So they just put something in there manly and warrior-like in its place. I am El Shaddai does not mean I am God Almighty. It means I am the God of breasts, 
female breasts. The word shod, the root word shod in El Shaddai means female breasts. What this means is that the divine feminine God is watching out for the females. I am the God of breasts. Walk before me and behold, complete. Remember, he's appearing. She is appearing to Abraham. And then El Shaddai tells Avram that his name is going to be changed to Abraham since he, and he is no longer going to be a potential father of many nations. God is going to actualize uh, Abraham as the exalted progenitor of many nations. And El Shaddai the God of breasts also says, Abraham, stop calling your wife, who is a princess that you have treated like a slave. Stop calling her Sarai and start calling her Sarah, because I am going to actualize her as the queen mother of nations and kings, rulers and chieftains, and the Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace. And El Shaddai says to, uh, to Abraham, in effect, now here's how it's going to work. I've been telling you for decades that you are going to be a father. You should have got the idea long before this that it takes both a man and a woman. A man can't do it alone, especially if that man is impotent. So now we're going to have a real life object lesson that you will never forget. And all your male lineage after you will also never forget or else they will not be my people. You must circumcise the foreskin of your male organ and the foreskins of all the males in your household and all your relatives and everyone who works for you. Sacrifice your foreskins to me, El Shaddai, and do it throughout history forever. Why sacrifice the foreskins? In the Hebrew grammar, all nouns have a male or female gender. In Hebrew, the name for the masculine organ itself is basal, a masculine noun. But the foreskin is a feminine noun, or one. What El Shaddai is saying metaphorically to Abraham is that the feminine part of your sexual organ does not belong to you. It belongs to me. And every time you look down at yourself, remember the female is not yours, but mine. And you must not dominate or control or disrespect or manipulate or subjugate her. Or you will not fulfill your own dreams and sacred destiny. She's a queen. She knows how to reign especially over her own body. Therefore, at age 99, last chance, Abraham circumcises all of the males, which by this time 
maybe at a minimum a minimum estimate was around a thousand males. It must have been a bloody, unforgettable event. And Abraham did what he had to do. So let's wrap this up. The long awaited child was born to Sarah and Abraham. The promises did come true. The dreams were fulfilled. The nations and the kings came forth. And the world has been blessed. Sarah and Abraham's story tells us that God can work with all kinds of people of all genders, no matter how unique or peculiar they are, no matter if they are genetically mutated, inheritably dysfunctional, hormonally strange, socially queer, or a migrant, or a refugee, or a manipulator, or a deceiver. God can work with all of those because Abraham and Sarah were all of those. And God worked with them. It's not about men being created equal. We as human beings cannot fulfill our greatest hopes, our highest dreams, our noblest destiny. We cannot have life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness until we empower all humans equally as being made in the image of our creator God, El Shaddai. Let the people say amen.